A Summary and Interpretation of 12 Rules for Life by Jordan Peterson Narrated and Interpreted by Alexander Sandalis Rule 6 Set your house in perfect order before you criticize the world We're going to start this rule with a story by Hercules, son of Zeus and champion of mankind Now, this story is not contained in this book this is a story that I found that I think pertains very accurately to the philosophy that's contained within this rule. The goddess Hera hated Hercules for being born of her husband's adultery, so she struck him with the temporary curse of madness. As a result, Hercules killed his wife and children. Consumed by grief, Hercules sought out the Oracle of Delphi, who told him that the path to atonement lay with his cousin, King Eurystheus. Eurystheus hoped to humiliate Hercules with ten impossible tasks that pitted him against invincible monsters. These became known as the labors of Hercules. The first labor was to slay the Nemean lion who kidnapped women and devoured warriors. Its golden fur was impervious to arrows, but Hercules cornered the lion in its dark cave, stunned it with a club, and strangled it with its bare hands. There was no tool sharp enough to skin the lion until the goddess Athena suggested using one of its own claws. Hercules returned to Eurystheus wearing the lion's hide, frightening the king Eurystheus so much he hid in a wine jar. From then on, Hercules was ordered to present his trophies at a safe distance. Subsequent labors included slaying a hydra, hunting a single deer for one year, stealing a herd of magical red cattle from a giant with three heads. Hercules had completed his ten labors. Eurystheus had claimed that two did not count because he had accepted help in achieving them. So Eurystheus created two additional labors. One, to obtain gold and sacred apples. And two, bring back a three-headed hound Cerberus who guarded the underworld. Once Hercules had completed his last task, Eurystheus declared Hercules' service complete. After 12 years of pain, suffering and toil, Hercules had redeemed the tragic deaths of his family and earned a place in the Pantheon. Through his labors, Hercules tamed the world's madness by atoning for his own. This is what we can learn from Hercules. Practically, this means to me, set your house in perfect order before you criticize the world. You see, Hercules, his house was not in order. His life was in disarray. He had been cursed by madness, he had killed his family, and instead of criticizing the world, instead of blaming his situation, admonishing those around him, instead of being consumed by darkness and grief and horror and suffering and terror and seeking revenge against the goddess Hera, he seeked guidance from an oracle. Not unlike people seek guidance from our own oracles of today. Jordan Peterson will struggle to admit this, but he is an oracle for many. So people look to him, people like him as an oracle and we seek guidance from, from people like him. So what that is saying is that you don't need a goddess or a god, or to be a god, or the son of Zeus, to clean your room and set your house in perfect order. Instead of looking around you and cursing the world around you, seek guidance from those you respect, as Hercules did in the Oracle of Delphi, and then pay for your sins. Pay for the path to atonement. And the path of atonement lay through suffering, Pain. And Hercules' case, 12 impossible tasks that pitted him against invincible monsters. While there are no mythological invincible monsters here today, there are metaphorical invincible monsters that people create for themselves. People manifest their own monsters. They create their own barriers and, and blocks and set themselves up to be prisoners of their own minds. And so that becomes the invincible monster. So can you go to war with yourself? In the same way Hercules ad accomplished and maneuvered through 12 impossible labors, can you get through 
your own set of impossible labors. And this could be as simple, and this is actually represented rather, this is symbolized by setting your house in perfect order. The impossible lay before you could mean cleaning up the mess of a room that you have, getting one item each day that is on the floor, one piece of chaos that is on the floor each day and putting it away. Or it could mean smiling at somebody on the street one time per day because you're miserable and you're not happy with your life and you're depressed and you're anxious and you don't know what to do about it and you don't know how you can be better and it seems so overwhelming and you seem feel so consumed by the darkness of the world around you so you decide to do one piece of good every day one just small the smallest piece of good you can find and you walk through that it could mean having a hard conversation with somebody with somebody someone you're in a relationship with not letting mediocrity not standing for mediocrity in a relationship it's so easy to let things pass and i've done this before you could it's so easy to let the difficult conversation not be had but you have to have the difficult conversation because that's where growth happens that's where your labor is housed and by getting through that that's how you can set your house in perfect order your life in order everyone has their version of the labor it could mean it could mean for example for myself setting my house in perfect order means suffering it means physically going through physical suffering it means doing what i say i'm going to do and do it Every weekend, I run hills. It's not fun. It's painful. In fact, it's some of the most painful physical endurement that I've had in years. But I love it and I relish it because I need it. I need to build calluses in my mind. And those calluses in my mind help build the foundation to set my life in order. Because if I don't do what I say I'm going to do, then I can't set my life in order. I can't set my house in order. I suffer and then the people around me suffer. If I think the temporary suffering I'm going to do by 15, 20 minutes of running up hills is hard, imagine a whole life. Imagine weeks and months and years on end of, of knowing that your life could have been so much better. And so this is what the story of Hercules teaches us. This is what the 12 labors of Hercules teaches us and teaches me. That before you criticize the world, you must set your house in order. By taking one meaningful small task every day, whatever that means for you, whether it's physical, mental, however it expresses itself, you must step forward into that. Because the alternative is just, it's chaos. <sighs> Let's start this rule now. Peterson starts this law by discussing how people criticize the world, how people admonish the world. And we're going to just first of all discuss that before how you can fix everything. Whenever we experience injustice, real or imagined, whenever we encounter tragedy or fall prey to machinations of others, Whenever we experience the horror and pain of our own apparently arbitrary limitations, the temptation to question being and then to curse it rises foully from the darkness. Why must innocent people suffer so terribly? What kind of bloody horrible planet is this anyway? Life is in truth very hard. Everyone is destined for pain and slated for destruction, just like Hercules. And so it's easy to criticize the world. He says that we say that to say, we, there's every reason to criticize the world around us. There is malevolence everywhere that you want to find it. And then so people like me think, I really think this a lot of the time. Well, if you're suffering, why don't you just fix yourself? Just fix yourself. It's very frustrating for me at times. It's like, man, if I fix myself, why can't you? No, sorry, I haven't fixed myself. <laughs> I'm far from being fixed. I'm broken in many ways. But if I'm trying to fix myself, and if I've fixed many components of my character, then why can't you? I've gone through suffering. Why can't you? Because we know 
Sometimes if those who are suffering change their behavior, then their lives would unfold less tragically. <laughs> but human control is limited. That's the challenge that I and people who have similar thoughts to me have to contend with. Human control is limited. We are not omnipotent, omnipresent beings that, that are like a God. But we are like a God in that we can control ourselves. And that at the same time, we must have empathy for one another, that we're all dealing with terrible afflictions of, 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 of darkness that we don't know about. Everyone's suffering from something you, you don't know about, I don't know about, we don't know about. So empathy must be directed and compassion. And so what about mass killings? What about the Columbine shooters? In fact, that's how Jordan, that's how Peterson starts this rule. In fact, one of the members of the Columbine duo wrote this. The human race isn't worth fighting for, only worth killing. Give the earth back to the animals. They deserve it infinitely more than we do. Nothing means anything anymore. <sighs> Just sit with that for a second. Just sit with that. I know a lot of Americans watch my videos. Like That should sit deeply with a lot of you. I'm very thankful to live in a country where mass killings, the last mass killing hadn't occurred for a very long time. However, by June of 2016 in America, unbelievable as it may seem, there had been 1,000 mass killings defined as four or more people shot in a single incident, excluding the shooter, in the US in 1260 days. That's one such event every five or six days for more than three years. And you can see why people are so outraged and so confused. Uh, people say, we don't understand. And then Peterson purports, how can we still pretend that? Tolstoy understood more than a century ago. The ancient authors of the biblical story of Cain and Abel understood. They described murder as the first act of a post edenic history. And not just murder, but fratricidal murder. Murder not only of someone innocent, but of someone ideal and good. And the murder done consciously to spite the creator of the universe. So then, it's just another reason to criticize the world, isn't it? Of course it is. I don't blame people. We can't blame people. Or can we? Hmm. I don't know. Vengeance or transformation. That is the choice. Isn't it? Nietzsche wrote, Distress, whether psychic, physical, intellectual, need not at all produce nihilism. Such distress always permits a variety of interpretations. And this basically represents the subchapter of this rule, Vengeance or Transformation. Nietzsche is explaining how you can either pick the path of vengeance, nihilism, or the path of transformation via distress, okay? But what he meant was this, people who experience evil may certainly desire to perpetuate it, to pay it forward, but it is also possible to learn good by experiencing evil. A bully boy can mimic his tormentors, yes, but he can also learn from his own abuse that it is wrong to push people around and to make their lives miserable. Someone tormented by her mother can learn from her terrible experiences of how important it can be to be a good parent. And this is uh, represented by a story I'm about to tell. Peterson had a client who did not have good parents. Her mother died when she was very young. Her grandmother raised her and was bitter, harrowing, and over-concerned with appearances. Her grandmother mistreated her daughter, Peterson's client, punishing her for her virtues of creativity, sensitivity, and intelligence. Unable to resist acting out her resentment, for an admittedly hard life on a granddaughter. She had a better relationship with her father, but he was an addict who died badly while she cared for him. And my client had a son. So the person who was tormented by her grandmother had a son. She perpetuated none of this with him. He grew up truthful and independent and hardworking. Instead of widening the tear in the cultural fabric, she inherited and transmitted and sewed it up. She rejected the sins of her forefathers. Such things can be done. By rejecting the sins of her forefathers, she set her house in perfect order instead of criticizing the world, instead of criticizing her grandmother. It is likely, no, it is certain, in fact, that there are many people 
who are listening to this right now, who have lived similar situations or know somebody who has lived in a similar situation where they have grown up in a household that has tried to traumatize them, whether consciously, unconsciously, with malevolence or, or not. But they have been uh, traumatized by their fractured upbringing. And a lot of these people choose the path of nihilism as Nietzsche reports. Or they choose the path of redemption. The path of transformation is the word I was looking for. It's up to you. It's not easy. But it is up to you. And this is represented by the majority of people being abused as children do not actually abuse their own children. We're going we're to explain how this is the case. Because this originally I read this, I'm like, really? How's this so? Peterson purports this is a well-established fact that can be termed via arithmetic. If one parent abused three children, and each of those three children had three children, and so on, then there would be three abuses for the first generation. Nine the second, 27 the third, 81 the fourth, and so on exponentially. After 20 generations, more than 10 billion would have suffered childhood abuse. More people than currently inhabit the planet. But instead, abuse disappears across generations. People constrain its spread. That's a testament to the genuine dominance of good over evil in the human heart. That's a choice at transformation instead of vengeance. A choice and also a representation of humankind, which I believe is inherently good, but also has the capacity for unbelievable evil. Unbelievable evil. Capacity is the operative word there. There's a play called The Cocktail Party, and one of the characters in it explains this to her psychiatrist. She says she hopes that all her suffering is her own fault. And the psychiatrist is taken aback. He asks why? Why would you want all your suffering to be your fault? What a burden to bear. She's thought long and hard about this and she says she has come to the following conclusion. If it's her fault, if all her suffering is her fault, she might be able to do something about it. If it's God's fault, however, if it's the universe's fault, if it's her fault, if it's your fault, if it's his fault, if it's my family's fault, if it's, if it's my school's fault, if it's the police officer's fault, if it's anybody else's fault, if reality is flawed, hell-bent on ensuring her misery, your misery, then you are doomed, and so is she. And you can't change the structure of reality itself, of the universe itself, and more than often than not, of other people. But maybe you can change your own life. In fact, I believe you can. In fact, you can. It's done every day. And so that, you give yourself the power for change. To get yourself out of suffering by assuming all responsibility. I wholeheartedly believe this. It's, it's really accepting everything is my fault. Everything is my fault. And this is like, what do you mean everything's your fault? It can't be your fault. I have to. I have to accept everything is my fault. Because I can only change myself. Yeah, I can help maybe craft or inspire or mold other people slightly here and there. But really it is up to them and really it is a result of them. So I can't rely on something out of my control. But I can rely on something in my control and that's me. So I give myself the power and the autonomy and that is enriching. That is powerful to me. That is where growth the foundation of growth is. Alexander Scholznitsyn, who wrote the Gulag Archipelago, probably one of the most important texts ever written, grew up during the Nazi regime, during the war. And he was in a concentration camp for a long time. And during this time, obviously filled with a lot of pain, suffering and horror, he contemplated his behavior deeply. And he asked himself, the most difficult of questions, such as, how had his personality contributed to the catastrophe of his life? He reconsidered his whole life in the time there. He had plenty of time to win the camps. 
How had he how had he missed the mark in the past? How many times had he acted against his own conscience, engaging in actions that he knew to be wrong? How many times had he betrayed himself and lied? Was there any way his past could be rectified and atoned for in the muddy hell of the Soviet gulag? Imagine that, you know, you hear about the terror and catastrophe of living within a concentration camp during that time. And you think just, you, you can barely comprehend it, the amount of malevolence that is being experienced. And then you think, how can Schultz Nitzen use his time there to then reflect on his own life in a way that assumes all responsibility of pain and suffering on himself? He poured over the details of his life with a fine-tuned comb, like he was uh, in a goddamn meditation retreat. But he was in the opposite of one. He asked himself, how can he stop making mistakes now? How can he repair the damage done by his past failures? He took himself apart piece by piece while his world around him was being taken apart piece by piece. This is, this is astonishing to me because uh, now, in a time, the majority of people are growing up in the time where it's the opposite. It's never been better to be a human being for the majority of people. And yet, we do the opposite. We don't ask ourselves these difficult questions. We become too soft. We've, we've, we're too fluffy. We're not asking the hard questions because our, our situation doesn't demand asking hard questions because it's very easy to go through life without asking hard questions. I don't have to do this. You guys think this is fucking enjoyable? This is not enjoyable. I force myself to do this. This is a way of suffering. I'm picking my, my, myself apart piece by piece by discussing these ideas out loud. That is not easy. I don't need to be rewarded from it. I don't want any praise for it. Because it's what we should do. It should be a right. It should be a given as a human being to do this. I'm just astonished that 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 Schultzenson took this time to pick himself apart during this 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 historical time in in a Soviet prison camp system. And without it, Without it, he wouldn't have wrote the Gulag Archipelago and the one man's decision to change his life instead of cursing fate. Back to the back to the title of the chapter. Instead of criticizing the world, instead of cursing fate, he took responsibility, set his house in order, shook the whole pathological system of the co communist tyranny to its core by writing the Gulag Archipelago. If you are suffering, well, that's the norm. People are limited and life is tragic. If your suffering is unbearable, however, and you are starting to become corrupted, here's something to think about. And here we go to how to clean up your life. Consider your circumstances. Start small. As I said in the beginning, ask yourself, have you taken full advantage of the opportunities offered to you? Most likely not. Most of us don't. Are you working hard on your career or even your job? Or are you letting bitterness and resentment hold you back and drag you down? Have you made peace with your brother? Are you treating your spouse and your children with dignity and respect? Do you have habits that are destroying your health and your well-being? Are you truly shouldering your responsibilities? Have you said what you need to say to your friends and your family members? Are there things that you could do, that you know you could do, that would make things around you better? Have you cleaned up your life? If the answer is no, here's something to try. Start to stop doing what you know to be wrong. Start stopping today. Don't waste time questioning how you know that what you're doing is wrong. Inappropriate questioning can confuse without enlightening as well as deflecting from your action. You know, we use self-questioning. I've done it before. It's a very tricky, manipulative tactic that uh, abstains responsibility from yourself. You start asking yourself questions, picking apart your situation, like you're actually doing meaningful self-reflective work, but you're really just dancing around the problem where with this, with what I just said, with what I just quoted from Peterson, this is the purpose of this is to not do that. So Peterson purports, stop acting in that particular manner. 
Stop saying those things that make you weak and shamed. Say only those things that make you strong. Do only those things that you could speak with honor. You can use your own standards of judgment. You can rely on yourself for guidance. You don't have to adhere to some external arbitrary code of behavior. Although you should not overlook the guidance of your culture. Life is short and you don't have time to figure everything out on your own. The wisdom of the past was hard earned and your dead ancestors may have something useful to tell you. Don't blame capitalism, the radical left, or the inequity of your enemies. Don't reorganize the state until you've ordered your own experience. Have some humility. If you cannot bring peace to your household, how dare you try and rule a city? If you cannot bring peace to your household, how dare you try and rule other people and control other people? And I'm talking to myself here because I've tried this in the past. And how dare I? How dare I? How dare we? How dare you? When you know that you have left something undone, you will act to correct the omission. Your head will start to clear up as you stop filling it with lies. After some months and years of diligent effort, your life will become simpler, less complicated, and your experience will improve. Your judgment will improve. You will, you will untangle your past. You will become stronger and less bitter. You will move more confidently into the future. You will stop making your life unnecessarily difficult. You will then be left with the inevitable bare tragedies of life. But they will no longer be compounded with bitterness and deceit. Perhaps you will discover that your now less corrupted soul, much stronger than it might otherwise have been, is now able to bear those remaining, necessary, minimal, inescapable tragedies. Perhaps you will even learn to encounter them so that they stay tragic, merely tragic, instead of de degenerating into outright hell. Maybe your anxiety and hopelessness and resentment, anger, however murderous, initially, will recede. Perhaps your uncorrupted soul will then see its existence and genuine good as something to celebrate even in the face of your own vulnerability. Perhaps you will become an even more powerful force for peace and whatever is good. Perhaps you will then see that if all people did this in their own lives, the world might stop being an evil place or at least will be less evil. After that, with continued effort, Perhaps it could even stop being tragic place. Who knows what existence might be like if we all decided to strive for the best. Who knows what eternal heavens might be established by our spirits, purified by truth, aiming skyward, right here on the fallen earth. Set your house in perfect order before you criticize the world. Please.